Thanks for listening to Other People's Flowers. If you'd like to have your work feature in the program, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. We hope you enjoy this episode. This week's work comes from Janine McBrity. Janine McBrity is a graduate of San Diego State University who taught political science and sociology. Her fiction, poetry and photographs have been published in over 200 print and online journals. She won the Eastern Kentucky English Department Award for Graduate Creative Nonfiction in 2011 and a Silver Pen Award in 2015 for her noir short story, Red's Not Your Colour. She lives in Kentucky and writes full-time when she's not watching classic movies and eating chocolate. Red Terror Major Gunner's eyes shone like glacier legs, and his collar clawed his neck as he stood defiant, staring over the heads of his surrendered soldiers towards a day of reckoning. Kill him, Duval, Captain Solcross advised, as he stared down at the soldiers massed on one of St. Michael's Mount plateaus. He's given you a white flag, but his soul won't rest until he gets vengeance. Major Duval shifted his gaze to his aide-de-camp. You're a fool. I execute him now. I'll unleash a spirit no mortal army can subdue. Remember? The tree of patriotism is watered by the blood of martyrs. Tired, dirty and hungry, the German patriots sat in formation in the dewy grass. Many caught up on the sleep they'd missed during the three-week siege of the Mount. In the countryside below, a fatally delayed supply train was stalled 50 miles away, or so Duval believed after intelligence reported an intercepted message. Do you think the bastards blamed Gunner for their plight? Solcross asked. He blamed Duval for the loss of half a division in the assault up the Mount, when they could have waited for hunger and thirst to do the work of valuable ammunition and precious lives. You know the answer to that, Captain. The most uneducated German is still smarter than our brightest grunts. They know officers aren't gods, the Major said without emotion. Maybe it's their military training that makes them so forgiving. No, Duval corrected. Forbearance is in their blood. Get them fed and watered. We'll keep them here until General Cox tells me where to put them. For now, a corral made of razor wire would have to do. Do you think it wise to waste our supplies on them? Lieutenant Presser is sure we can capture the train when we find it. It held the key to their victory, and now it's the key to our survival. But Solcross feared the worst. Presser had trouble finding his ass. If they're hungry, they'll stay compliant, reminded him. You'll be outnumbered, even though you hold all their weapons. Weak people may be compliant, but starving people get desperate and do crazy things. As soon as Duval drove off down the mount, Solcross put everyone on half rations and immediately sent out hunting parties with the instruction, If you think we can eat it, kill it. By the end of the week, he realised, even if Duval didn't, that he and Presser wouldn't find a train that wasn't there. He ordered his sergeants to organise work details among the strongest prisoners, including Major Gunner, to dig latrines. By Sunday, a hundred sick, starving and wounded German soldiers were dead, leaving 1,500 able-bodied men to be guarded by the last 200 GIs of Company E. That night, Captain Solcross was awakened by a deep and low thunder. He pulled on his boots and pants and came out of his tent to greet what he believed must be a supply convoy. Sergeant Nichols was hurrying towards him. What the hell is going on, Sergeant? he demanded of the half-dressed man, as bleary-eyed as he. What's that noise? I have no idea, sir. They staggered towards the corral in the brightness of a full yellow moon and found the German soldiers, stripped to their underwear, standing in concentric circles around Gunner, who was standing on a makeshift dice of rocks. Slowly the circles moved clockwise as the men chanted a strange dirge and beat their chests lightly with their right fists. Blunt und Boden. Sergeant Nichols whispered, blood and soil. Are they praying for their dead, maybe? I don't know, but it's going to stop. Have the men push the jeep around. I want the son of a bitch to see me. He climbed into the jeep and stood on the seat. Nichols fired off three pistol rounds and the chanting stopped. Down on the ground, all of you, you too, gunner, or we fire. 
The men went to ground and put on their clothes and coats, huddling close to each other to keep warm. Have Corporal Ellison find Gunner and bring him to my tent, Nichols, and pass the word the danger is over. Remind our soldiers the prisoners aren't supermen. And find out what those shiny spots are inside the corral. Nichols navigated his way down the ten-foot slope, and, careful to avoid the razors, reached inside the corral, dipped his fingers into first one pool, then another, and brought them to his nose. Blood, he said when he returned to Solcross's tent. Solcroft laughed to himself as he put on his shirt and strapped his holster to his side. Maybe we acted too harshly. Sergeant, if these sons of bitches want to commit mass suicide, let them. The sooner they're gone, the sooner we can get out of this place. Ellison shrugged and gave a sloppy salute while Nichols snapped too when Solcroft stepped through the curtain that he used to create a bedroom. At ease. Now. Major Gunner, tell me why you interrupted my sleep. You know little of our heritage, Gunner explained. We honour our ancestors and those that go to join them. In battle, there is no time. But now the battle is over. It is time for Odin to protect us. Leave us, Solcroft said to the two men. Odin, huh? Now I've heard everything. What's he going to do? Swoop down in a fiery chariot? Make it rain manna from heaven? Solcross motioned for Gunner to sit opposite him and poured the last glass of his whiskey into a shot glass. To your ancestors, you damn fool, he toasted, drank it, and smacked his lips in satisfaction. May I? Gunner said. He picked up the bottle, tipped it over, and filled the shot glass again. He raised it and drank down the brown liquid before Solcross could object. To our ancient gods. The captain snatched the bottle and tipped it over. Not a drop escaped. He tossed the bottle over Gunner's shoulder and it hit hard dirt with a thud. Now I know it's all gone. And soon your food also, I'd say. From those hunting parties you've been sending out, there isn't any game on the mount, Captain. The noise of the guns and vehicles scared everything living away. Maybe old Odin will take care of my men the way he takes care of your men. How about that? Nah, by the way, where's Papa Odin been for the past six weeks? Vacationing on the Riviera? Maybe he's riding a train. Solcroft grabbed his pistol and pointed the barrel at Gunner's heart. Where is it? I've been on this mountain terrace longer than you. How would I know? All I know is that you don't know where the train is. I ought to shoot you. Major Duval would have you up on charges. He hates you as much as you hate him. Nichols, get in here. The sergeant rushed in and tripped over the whiskey bottle. He landed at Gunner's feet. Sorry, sir. Get him out of here before I kill him. Gunner helped Nichols to his feet and put that damn bottle in a trash can somewhere, Solcross added. Trash can, sir? We don't have any trash cans. Then put it up Gunner's ass, but get it out of here. Trickery, Solcross muttered to himself as he lay on his cot. It had to be. He thought the damn bottle was empty, but it wasn't. And that was that. Maybe it was the way the bottle was shaped, the narrowing in the middle, holding one last shot. The distiller probably did it on purpose to make people think it was time to buy more. He'd try to radio Duval again in the morning. He'd have to get his men off the mount soon, with or without orders, unless they could find something to eat. As for prisoners, he'd start them digging a big pit for the inevitable. Each day, a dozen prisoners were marched a mile into the forest, given shovels and told to make the trench deeper and longer. Conditions have changed, Solcross told Nichols. Use the weak also. The more who die from work, the fewer bullets we'll need to use. We've got to have enough to finish the job unless we want to kill them by hand. Duval hasn't given an order like that, has he? Not yet, but he will, Solcross assured him. I don't believe that. On the other hand, the men can't wait to be evacuated much longer. They've won the battle and want to bathe and see a movie, at least. What is Duval's order? We're to wait another week. Can we appeal to the Red Cross? Nichols asked. If we could turn the prisoners over to somebody else. Solcross had rescued his whiskey bottle and put it on the table. He'd filled it with water again and again, trying to duplicate Gunner's trick. The Red Cross doesn't run POW camps. Starting tomorrow, make the groups 20 to 30. They're to dig all day. No rest. They can't work on less than 500 calories a day. I don't want them to work. I want them to die. Why the hell aren't they dying? 
Nichols obeyed the order, but when the work details returned after ten hours, the prisoners showed no sign of fatigue. They're strong bastards, I give them credit for that. Our men didn't turn a spade of dirt and they're faint with exhaustion. We've got to feed the men, sir. What do we have left? Solcross used his sleeve to wipe his forehead. Just talking about food made him sweat. A couple of crates of K rations, a meal a day per man, and they can last another three days if we don't feed the prisoners. Nichols was always thorough. Damn it. Solcross landed a fist on the table. How can these Germans hang on? We're almost dead and they look like they're getting stronger. Like they're drinking our strength through invisible straws. Gunner's right. There's no game to eat. All we have is a well and a stream with no fish in it. Where the hell did everything go? Nichols sank into a chair. I don't know. I don't know anything except my guts hurt. Maybe we should ask Gunner what he'd do. He grew up here. He'd know where to find food. Make pine needle soup, maybe. Become his prisoners, you mean? Solcross said sullenly. Maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. Let him and Odin take care of us. And what happens when we give up the weapons? You don't think he'd kill us if we surrendered to him? I can't think any more about anything, sir. Get some sleep, Sergeant. It was just an offhand remark, but the message was clear. He couldn't take care of 500 men, while Gunner managed three times that many, every one of them haggard and supposedly demoralised just eight days ago. Now they spent their time constructing huts made of stone, sod and pine branches, and sang around campfires in the evening. There was only one explanation that could account for their survival, no matter how improbable. They had food. He stared at his wine bottle, loaves of bread and fishes from the ancient gods. Maybe Odin had heard their prayer after all, he thought as dust settled on HQ. Sir, Duval sent a message by a runner. A breathless nickel said as he rushed into the tent, carrying a leather pouch that he shoved into Solcross's hand. Come in, why don't you? Solcross said flatly. He lit the lantern, opened the leather pouch, and removed the folded paper. Did they find the train, sir? Nickel said when he'd barely finished reading. No, they went sixty miles in each direction, but no train. Solcross held the paper over the lantern until it caught fire. Hell, there probably isn't any train. Make sure our men get full rations tonight. We're leaving tomorrow as soon as we... Bury the dead. Nichols went pale. We can't kill 1,500 men, sir. Duval didn't order that. He wouldn't go against the Geneva Convention. Did you read his order? No, sir. Then shut up. And bring Gunner to me. Even in a worn, dirty uniform, Gunner appeared regal. He needed a bath and a shave, and his boots no longer hugged his calves. Still... His eyes were alert, and his hands steady. Sit down, Major. You're going to tell me where it is, or I'm going to kill you. I told you, I don't know where the train is. He made himself comfortable, extending his long legs before crossing them at the knee, and leaning one arm on the back of the chair. I'm talking about your food supply. Where is it? Don't pretend you don't have one. I did a head count today, while you were out digging dirt. You know how many surrendered? Sixteen hundred and thirty-seven. A thousand of them sick or wounded. Today I counted fifteen hundred and thirty-seven living and healthy men. In other words, since your little ritual display for the dead, the dying has stopped. I want to know how that's possible, and you're going to tell me. I told you. Odin protects us. Don't give me bullshit when I want information. You know where that goddamn train is. Gunner picked up the whiskey bottle and read the label. Sterling Scotch. Never heard of it. Give me a drink and I'll tell you what you want to know. Solcross poured him a glass of water. Turn it into wine and maybe I'll believe your Odin crap. The mount is dedicated to St. Michael, but before the Benedictines claimed it and built their monastery, there was a sacred oak at the top, its roots running the depth and breadth of the mount itself. Gunner sipped at the water as though it was fine liqueur. If you go into the inner courtyard of the monastery, you'll see a ten-foot statue of St. Michael carved from what was left of the oak when they removed the limbs from the trunk. When the moon is full, the land weeps blood for the slain old tree. 
It frightened the monks so badly that every full moon they stripped off their clothes and beat their breaths in mea culpas. Are you frightened of blood, Captain? Soulcross's forehead beaded with sweat. Battlefields run red with blood, Major. The earth can only absorb so much rain. He felt the butt of his pistol, his talisman in times of threat. Why didn't he kill Gunner here and now, cut off the head of the snake and its body slithers aimlessly until it dies? Why didn't he kill him? Because he hadn't finished his wine, of course. Because his Nazi soldiers would charge his guards. Because the blood-red World War I battle scars his father wore made him so ugly he couldn't bear to look at him. Our penance meant nothing to you, but to us it was our sacred homage, our blood, our soil. If Odin owns all this dirt, why didn't he help you defend it? Solcross demanded. He had so many questions. Why had Duval abandoned him? Did he intend for his impetuous captain to commit a war crime to absolve himself? Duval said they hadn't found the train, but maybe it was a lie. Did he want the Germans to slaughter them to cover up his mistake in the assault? Should he call his wife in Jersey City? Odin has protected us. He put us under the command of a fool. You counted us, Captain. But have you counted your own men? Sawcross felt a shard of pain pierce his head. He hadn't driven the perimeter of the corral because he was short on gasoline and he was too weak to walk it. It was the same for Nichols. Only he hadn't had the dry heaves for the past four days. Was it the water? Maybe the hunting parties had found game and ate it before their return if they returned at all. Can thoughts swim like frightened fish? Are you accusing my men of desertion, Major? Certainly not. I'm accusing them of wisdom. It's a valuable commodity. Odin revered it so much, he traded an eye for it. Gunnar put his hand to his left eye and popped out a glistening glass orb. He held out his palm for Solcroft to see. Get that disgusting thing away from me, the captain muttered. Tell me about the food. Gunnar replaced his eye. We eat the dead. The four words congealed into a lead weight, dropping through the air with a rush of the wind surging from his lungs. You lie, Solcross whispered. It's impossible. Is it? Do you know your bivouac on the cemetery? All the terraces surrounding the mount are filled with corpses. We buried our battle dead here, thousands of them, like seeds in our blood and our soil. The harvest yielded what we needed to survive. Solcross grabbed the basin he kept next to his cot and retched. Allied propaganda warned about the evil of the enemy. Rape, torture, mercilessness. Why not cannibalism? He read something somewhere about the gnashing of teeth. He aimed his pistol again, this time at Gunner's head. Nichols, get in here. The sergeant holstered his sidearm when he saw Gunner seated sedately at the table. Yes, sir? We're going to kill every one of these bastards. Duval was right. Starving men do crazy shit. You're not well, sir. I said, line up the men. They're marching away from here tonight. But to where? Pretoria, Washington Post? Gunner didn't move. Not even a twitch that evidenced fear. Take what's left of your men, Captain Solcross. March down the mount, because we outnumber them, and they're in no condition to resist. Protect them from us. Pass the order, Nichols. We're evacuating. Captain, shouldn't we radio Duval and tell him we're coming? We don't want him shooting at us. I can't make radio contact, you imbecile. Get the jeep. You and I are leaving. Now. And leave our guys with the enemy? It's desertion, sir. We can't. We don't have any men. They've eaten them. And if we don't get out of here now, they'll eat us too. Don't you understand? Nichols shot Gunner a desperate glance. It's not true, sir. Our guys are standing guard. Lopez, Johnson, Holclaw, Bannister. They're locked and loaded. Are you sure? Do you know them? Well, not personally, but then give the order to fire. Go ahead. See how many shots you hear. Solcross held his pot helmet and wine bottle in one hand, his pistol in the other. I'm leaving, Sergeant. Are you coming with me? No, sir. I won't desert the men. Solcross raised his pistol and fired. Nichols fell at the officer's feet, and Gunner slid off his chair and knelt next to him. 
He felt for a pulse. Nothing. He got Nichols' pistol from his holster and ducked under the table as far as he could. He didn't know how many men guarded their commander. As though he was beyond remembering, Solcross walked out of the tent without a word. Gunner heard the jeep driving off. He slowly rose from the ground and waited, expecting someone to come rushing in. Minutes passed. Was it possible no one heard the shot? He snuffed out the lantern and walked out into the darkness alone, listening to his men entertaining themselves around the flames that dotted the land below. Duval had used the lower terrace for his HQ during the slog up the mount. Now his men used it as a war spar to recuperate. Perhaps they'd forgotten the sound of a report. Never mind. They would recall later, and for the rest of their lives. Solcross was right. His men were gone. A few deserted early on in groups of two and threes when they took prisoners out to dig their own grave searching for food, as all animals do. Solcross was right. His men were gone. A few deserted early on in groups of two and threes when they took prisoners out to dig their own grave, searching for food, as all animals do, further and further away from the camp until they disappeared from the care and memory of their officers. What, he wondered, would the wandering soldiers tell Duval if and when they found him? He walked down to the corral and through the crude gate where Sergeant Kurtz pretended to stand guard. You are alone, sir? For the time being, we're completely alone, Gunner said. Will Duval and Solcross come back? I don't know. If they do, they'll find their men in a beautifully dug trench. What about the train? We'll leave it in the tunnel, Kurtz. And there's a dead soldier in Solcross's tent. Make sure he gets an honourable burial. That night, the prisoners finished off Allied K-rations. Tomorrow they'd bathe, shave, and walk the mile into the woods where old railroad tracks let an engine and two rail cars deliver ammunition, medicine, and rations to the terminus inside the uncompleted tunnel. But Gunner's soldiers couldn't get to the supplies once the Allies decided to use the southern slope for a staging area. The five-man train crew had just enough time to camouflage the tunnel entrance before scrambling up to the monastery before the siege began. The Allies crossed the Rhine by the Remagen Bridge, the engineer had told Gunner, and the Major knew the war was lost. The best he could do now was to return his men to their families to ensure the survival of the race. The only way to do that, Gunner calculated, was to surrender. When the work details returned from digging, they returned with full bellies and as much food as they could carry, and wearing Allied uniforms they stripped from dead Americans. Never had so many soldiers been so willing to work. Sometimes he could barely suppress a smile. Grouse a little, he instructed his men, and for God's sake, don't volunteer. If you're too eager, they'll know something's amiss. Prisoners are expected to be miserable. Don't disappoint the victorious. But how can captured people suppress hope and relief? They can't. No more than Solcross and his army could suppress their despair and confusion. They were the victors. So why couldn't they lay their burdens down? Why were their prisoners returning to health while they languished in want? Captain Solcross opened his eyes as the sunrise spread light on his face. He'd taken a wrong turn, or did he purposely drive up the mount to the monastery? For weeks before the siege, artillery and aerial bombardment had pulverised the ancient abode of monks and priests into rubble. He'd find no sanctuary here now, but he had to see for himself if Gunnar was telling the truth about everything or anything. Never underestimate the Hun, his father warned him, one armistice day. They were alone on the back porch, on a rare occasion when his father talked about his war service. Ruthlessness and cunning is a lethal combination. Never trust. The remembered words roused his energy and he peeled out of the jeep. He'd have to climb through the centuries-old broken stones and rotting corpses to find the centre courtyard, and he could barely walk. God, why hadn't he taken a K-ration at least? Even if he threw it up, at least he could quell the ache of hunger in his belly for a few minutes. He plodded on, sometimes crawling like a spider from one rock to the next, until he saw patches of brown winter grass blotched by bare rose bushes. 
He scanned right, then left, seeing what remained of a colonnade that formed the perimeter of the garden. There could be a sniper hiding among the ruins. A civilian fanatic, perhaps. Then he slowly looked up. From the great round root legs that spread through the garden thirty feet in every direction, there arose an oak trunk five feet in diameter and three feet tall pedestal, crowned by twelve-foot statue of St. Michael carved out of the wood. Such splendid wings and warrior's helmet. But where was the archangel's sword? Instead, across the powerful, armoured chest, two well-muscled arms held a huge axe, a daily reminder that Christianity triumphed over the ancient gods when Odin's sacred tree was felled. If the roots that remained after a thousand years, how many years before had it grown? One? Two thousand years? Solcross laid himself close to the trunk between two roots that cradled him like skeleton arms and gazed up at the morning sky. He would die here. His hand caressed the smooth, shiny root, and then fell over to a smaller vein. He felt something soft, furry. He struggled to raid himself, and peered over the root. Was it? Yes, a rabbit. Maybe frozen in the winter snow and thawing? Not in April. They were far to the south. He held the animal up to his eyes and quickly inspected it for a wound. He felt his heart racing. How did a rabbit get inside the sleeve of a German uniform? What breed of rabbit had no ears and five narrow legs that curved into a fist? He took out his pocket knife, plunged it into the strange beast's shoulder, and dragged it down through the muscled body. He tore off the cloth and sank his teeth into the flesh. Here was meat, blood, sinews, fat and bone. Here was one more precious day of life. Perhaps he'd have many more. For he saw plenty of game on this battlefield, German game, with fingers and blind eyes. If St. Michael spared him, he vowed, he'd find Gunner and kill him. He stared at the blood-stained knife blade. Raw meat wasn't the worst thing he ever tasted. Fear, shame, cowardice. Those were the things that made a man sick unto death. Other People's Flowers was produced by Hugo Gibson, Chris Kamon Vutitam, and Hamish Adam Kans. If you'd like to have your work featured on the show, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. Thank you for listening.